So a while ago, I made a video about why I have my own personal home server and it has been by far the most popular video on my channel. And I got a lot of comments on that video of people that are either looking to do this or have already done it, but have some questions about my setup. So what I wanna to do today is basically do an in-depth tutorial-ish kind of setup, setup video on how I set up my personal server and hopefully that can answer some of the questions or help any of you out there that have some hardware laying around or just looking to set up a home personal server for yourself. So before we get into this, I want to express that this is not a super high tech tutorial on how to set up a corporate server. Yes, I know that there are plenty of different ways to set up a home server. There are plenty of different softwares to use, but this is what I've used and it works for me. So that's what I'm going to show you. First thing, let's talk about hardware. Now, servers can be anything from giant supercomputers run by some of the biggest companies in the world uh, down to a Raspberry Pi that runs as a simple NAS server. You're probably gonna end up with something kind of in between there. Probably something like this. This was a old Dell Optiplex uh, that I got off Craigslist and put into a new case because the older one was kind of beat up. If you're looking for a simple home server, you'll probably end up with something like this. So that's what I wanna focus on. This video isn't specifically for people that are looking to drop thousands of dollars on high-end server grade hardware. If you're looking to spend a little bit more money um, to get something newer, I would strongly suggest looking at an AMD Ryzen 2600 or 3600 CPU and build around that. It's a six core, 12 thread processor. But basically for hardware, there's no real wrong answer as long as the hardware fits your use case and your budget, you can essentially make it work. The next is software. So software, this is where a lot of people will turn into keyboard warriors and decide that the software you use for your server is obviously not the best and you're an idiot and you should be using some off-brand crazy version of Linux that no one's ever heard of that's super optimized for their specific use case, but I don't do that. My base operating system that I use is Windows 10. The main reason I use Windows as my base operating system is because essentially I do gaming on it and gaming is possible on Linux. Uh, they've made great strides in the last few years uh, to make a lot of games playable. And you know, that's, that's awesome, but it's still nowhere near where Windows is in terms of gaming. I do run Windows 10, very familiar with it. If you're not into gaming on your server, you don't have to go with Windows. I would recommend some version of Linux. Ubuntu is the clear recommendation just because it's so familiar um, to someone making the change from Windows. Now, the first thing I want to discuss is what makes my server useful for me is the fact that I can access my server from anywhere in the world using Windows um, Remote Desktop, which is super convenient. There are a few things you need to do uh, to make sure this is working. So the first thing you're going to need to do is open um, ports. Now by default, um, the port you need to open is 3389. So if you don't know how to open ports, I would suggest looking on Google and finding that different routers have different interfaces, but I will quickly go over how it's done on mine. So my setup is that I have both a router and a modem. So the ports need to be open on both. First, I'm going to log into my router. Okay, so I have a Netgear router. Um, I think it's pretty standard on most Netgear routers. So you're gonna to wanna to go into advanced. And so under setup, the first thing you're gonna do is give your server a static IP address. Anything on your network connected to your router in your house is given a IP address every time it connects. 
If you go in your router, you can see a list of all the devices connected. A lot of the times, if it disconnects and then reconnects, a new IP address is given to it. If we give it a static IP address, that means that it stays the same. So this is useful because when we connect, we'll know what the IP address is every time, and we don't have to worry about looking it up or finding it whenever we're trying to pass through ports and whatnot. Um, in here, I go into LAN setup, and you can see here is my home server. It is 10.0.0.33. And from here on out, I know that that is going to be my address to my server um, every single time. The other part is ports. So we're going to go into port forwarding. So you can see in here, I have a few ports set up and, you know, I'll talk about these later, but you can see the very first one is Windows 10 server, external port, meaning the port that it's coming from, 3389, the port it's going to, 3389. A lot of the times, these are gonna match your external and internal. If you have more complicated networking setups, sometimes you can uh, route different ports into new internal ports, but we don't have to do that. The next step is on your modem. So if you don't have a router and modem built in, you will have to sign into your modem, AT&T. And what we're gonna do is we're going to go to firewall Applications, Pinholes, and DMZ um, is where you'd make those changes, but you can see very easily on here that the same ports I kind of had open on my router, I also opened on my modem. So in here, you can see RDP. We have uh, TCP and UDP 3389 open. So that's all you have to do. Now the port is open on your modem, the port is open on your router, the data can flow through. Pretty straightforward, so now you're set up to where you can remote directly in to your computer. I'm just running a Microsoft Remote Desktop software. This is available for Mac, it's available for PC. Okay, so for storage, um, this is gonna be heavily dependent on what you use your server for. Now, I use mine to store all the videos I make, all the photos I take. Yeah, I got an album. Dude, no, how man. many? But I'm not a rapper. No. I have games on it as well, so I do have quite a bit of storage. Um, I also run Plex, which takes up a good chunk. So I have two six terabyte hard drives running in RAID 1, meaning that um, while I have two six terabyte hard drives, um, they're mirror copies of each other. So essentially I'm only getting six or five and a half uh, terabytes. I also run a solid state array in RAID 5 for other things like games I don't want to load quickly and other types of data like um, operating systems used for virtualization. The way you can set these up in Windows is extremely easy. Go to Manage uh, Storage Spaces and you can create storage pools and it's extremely easy. Um, if you wanna know how I did it, I did a video where I set this up for one of my friends who I built a computer for. I will link that video right here towards the end. You can check out how I set up storage spaces. But you can see I have two storage pools. Here is my two-way mirror of six terabyte hard drives. You can see that there are two physical drives, each with 5.45 terabytes. And you can see, you know, 27.1, 27.1, they're mirror copies. So in the event that one drive fails, the other drive has the exact same data. I can take out the old one, put a new one in, and we're good. Uh, the solid state array is a little different. Um, you can see I have a total of 3.72 terabytes of, um, pool capacity, but I only have 2.46 terabytes of usable space. So if we go into, you know, my PC, you can see up, oh, here's my solid state array. Here's the 2.46 terabytes hard disk. Here's the 5.44 terabytes. And I have a separate one terabyte hard drive in there that's running my cloud-based storage. That's my storage setup. You can go into here um, and set these up to where you can share them across your local network. So this network one I have, um, it's being shared. So if I go into properties and sharing, you can see I have set this up for sharing and I can access that from any PC um, connected to my network. It's super convenient for file transfers. It's how I do my editing on my main PC, all served from the server in my living room. All right, gaming. If you're not gonna be gaming on this, you can completely skip this section. 
Um, I'll try to make it brief because it's, it's not too complicated. You're obviously gonna want your gaming software such as Steam, Origin, um, Epic. Obviously you install those, but one piece of software that makes this really useful is uh, Rainway. So Rainway is a uh, software that allows you to connect to your server from any PC, um, even your phone, and play games on that PC stream directly to your device. So this works locally as well as from anywhere that you have a network connection. So you can be in another state, another country. Obviously the latency is gonna be worse, but you can still sign in and play game. Um, they have a really good tutorial on their website. Everything I use is linked down below. So um, go look at Rainway, check it out if that's something you wanna use. But basically um, install that on the server and then you also have to open ports for uh, Rainway if you wanna access that outside your home network. So I believe it's 22,000 is the port that's used, but you can set that in the setting. I definitely recommend Rainway, super cool piece of software. Okay, so now virtualization, and this is where people can come in and flame you because there are so many different ways to do virtualization depending on your operating system and how you wanna handle the hardware in your system, um, but I'm using Oracle VirtualBox and it works perfectly for my needs and that's all I can ask for. I know there are other softwares out there that are more efficient and can handle hardware pass through of GPUs and all that good stuff, but I don't need any of that. I'm using Oracle VirtualBox, deal with it. VirtualBox is pretty straightforward. I wouldn't say there's very much of a learning curve. So in VirtualBox, this is where I run all my different operating systems. Essentially, I have a couple of Ubuntu systems and a Windows Server system. And you can install whatever you see fit. The way this works is to run an operating system, you have to first enable virtualization um, in your BIOS. For Intel, it's something called, usually called VTX that needs to be enabled. And for AMD, um, it's AMD V, but you know, depending on your motherboard and processor, um, you can look it up and it's easy to find out what setting you need to turn on to run virtualization. The next thing you have to decide what operating system you're using. So depending on the operating system, you'll have to go out and download that operating system's ISO file. And it's pretty straightforward. You go into file or machine, new, and then you type the name of what you wanna call it, the machine folder where you want your, basically your operating system to be stored. I run mine on my solid state array, the type. So if I'm running, you know, a 64 bit version of Ubuntu Linux, I can go into Linux, I can go down Ubuntu 64. Next, here's where you can specify um, how much RAM you want dedicated. I have 60, apparently 65 uh, gigabytes available. I'll give it four gigs. Hard disk, I always use the same thing, uh, create virtual hard disk now. So you give each uh, machine its own virtual hard disk. Um, VHD is more uh, compatible with multiple emulation softwares. I like dynamically allocated so that if you have, for example, a one terabyte physical hard drive and you assign, you know, 500 gigs to your virtual machine, if you select fixed size, it's immediately going to take away that 500 gigabytes. If you use dynamically, it will set aside that 500 gigs, but it's not going to physically remove it until you've used it. So if I only use, you know, 100 gigabytes, then I'll still have 900 gigabytes left over on that hard drive if I'm using dynamically allocated. And here's where you can set that and then create. And we're in. So the first time you go to boot or start, it's going to ask you for your ISO image. So I'm going to try to go start. It's going to power on, say select a startup disk. This is where you point to the ISO image that you've downloaded. So Windows makes it very easy to get an ISO. Uh, Linux makes it extremely easy to get an ISO. Just go to their respective sites and download the ISO file. So for example, I will do Ubuntu desktop 64 bit. And now we are running Ubuntu Linux in our Windows server. 
So that's gonna do the whole setup. I'm not gonna go through that. Someone asked, you know, why do you have, you know, a machine for, you know, doing all your different things when you could do it all in Windows? My answer to that is that I like to containerize each application. So uh, my development, my Plex, uh, my Windows development, my RTMP streaming server. In the event that something breaks, an application breaks, I have backups of each application. I don't have to revert an entire operating system just in case, you know, I'm messing around with something and break it. Essentially, hello? I can go in and take snapshots of each application's operating system. And if I break it, just revert that one back instead of having to roll back the entire thing. So one thing I also wanna note on here is that you can do shared storage with your base operating system. So um, for all of these uh, operating systems, my virtual machines, I can go into settings and down to shared folders and you can see that um, I am sharing my E drives shared folder with this virtual machine. That means anything I put on my Windows shared folder can be directly accessed by these virtual machines. So you can see if I go into my VPN machine, you can see mounted right here, shared. Downloads Plex. If we look on Windows, downloads Plex. If I add a folder here. What I also recommend for networking and the way you get your router to see these virtual machines as their own kind of physical machines is to go into network and change this. Um, I think by default it's generic driver or whatever, but change that to bridged adapter. And then it's going to select your native Windows um, network controller. So what that's going to do is pass all network activity um, through your host server's network connection, and your router will see that as its own connection. So that way, in the same way I assigned ports directly to my 10.0.0.33 server, I can give a static IP address to my Plex to my Plex server and um, route the ports directly through to that IP address. Uh, for display, I go with VBox SVGA. I found out that's the best graphics controller setting in terms of resizing windows. It seems to work the best. If you wanna change how much um, RAM is assigned to it, you can go into system. And if the machine stopped, you can make these modifications. You can also change how many cores of your processor are assigned to each machine, which is super convenient. So another good thing about VirtualBox is that you can easily take screen captures so that if something breaks, you can revert back. You just go in here, take screenshot. It takes a new state image of where you're at. Um, currently, you can clone it as well and kind of create two separate forks if that's what you want to do. Uh, I also run Nextcloud, which is what I use as my cloud-based NAS. This was actually probably the most complicated thing to set up, so I'm not going to cover it in this video because uh, it would already make this video even longer. So um, I will link the guide that I used below that kind of helped me get through the entire process. Uh, it's definitely really cool and fun to mess around with. Um, super convenient if you don't want to pay for something like uh, Dropbox or any other cloud-based storage subscriptions. I think that's the gist of my home server. Now, obviously, like I said before, this is my setup. This was the most convenient for me, and this setup works the best for me. So this is what I use. Now, I know there are many videos out there that go way more in depth and do way more with their home servers. And I definitely recommend go check that out if this was maybe a little too simple for you and you're looking to do a little bit more, go right ahead. So if you try this out and use some of the tips that I have shown you, uh, comment down below and tell me how it worked out. Um, if you have any other questions, do not hesitate to comment and ask. I love reading you guys' questions. Um, 
But my new hobby uh, lately has been getting into uh, Raspberry Pi stuff and using Python. Definitely a lot of LED coding for custom LED stuff, uh, like music lights and fire effects and drawing with web servers, self-hosted web servers. Definitely been having a lot of fun with the Raspberry Pi. So if you wanna see uh, what I've been doing with that, uh, comment down below. And if people are interested, then I'll show you what I have been doing there. But um, if you like this video, be sure to drop a like. If you loved it, subscribe and hit that bell so you're notified the next time we post something awesome. See you on the next one.